Christians and the like. So what I want to do today is talk about work in the energy and nuclear security area that is in some sense Pasteur's quadrant and even more just use-driven science and technology. My own career, I, I must say, the first half of it uh, was Bohr's quadrant, so-called, physics for understanding the structure of nature. The last, the last half, however, has been very much use-driven, both, as was said in the introductions, both in putting together at MIT and then leading uh, in the government, the development of technologies to solve energy problems, but often having to do that through really addressing scientific, fundamental scientific barriers to get there. And then sometimes in the nuclear security issue, uh, seeking an understanding uh, as opposed to any uh, fundamental uh, uh, science. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover that uh, in, going, in going forward. The, the threats that I will discuss, uh, as was mentioned, global threats, one, climate change, and the other one, nuclear security. The issues around nuclear weapons risks, uh, nuclear proliferation risks uh, uh, in the world. They're very different in nature, but they do indeed present global risks. I will just mention a third one. I will not discuss it, but a third one that I think is a very important and maybe a discussion here would be, would be helpful, I mean here at the university, uh, and that is the progress in biotechnology, in gene editing, uh, CRISPR, uh, and the role that they could play in global bio threats uh, is something very important. I do work on that actually, uh, but, but today we will, not, we will not focus on that. So let me turn to, uh, to climate change. The, um, Climate change, as you, I'm sure this audience knows, driven uh, largely by greenhouse gas emissions uh, from, uh, from human effort, largely energy use is the, as the majority, uh, pr providing the majority of the uh, CO2 emissions from, from fossil fuels. Uh, let me just, uh, if I can work this. No, is this on? The slides? Oh, there we go. Okay. So. <clears throat> This is a complicated uh, picture. We won't spend too much time on it. It's a projection to 2030 of how global energy production flows to various applications. The, uh, this is assuming no major effort, policy effort, for example, to address climate change. So this is the world we don't want to see uh, uh, in a certain sense. But gives you an idea of the expectations. And what you can see is the, um, oh, by the way, a, a quad is a quaint English unit. It's roughly an exajoule, <laughs> 10 to the 18th joules, but we don't care about the numbers really here. Uh, the, uh, the idea is what you see here is the fossil fuels, uh, uh, coal, oil, and natural gas uh, providing the majority of the, uh, of the energy inputs and then you see, what you see there is they flow to the right, and you see how they support transportation, industry, buildings, light and heat, and of course, much, some of that going through the intermediate stage of electricity production. The gray on the, the top half there on the, on the right, the gray is fundamentally uh, the energy that is lost from heat to the atmosphere. There. And, uh, but again, you see how this all flows. You see industry in this picture. Uh, th this is global, not, not, not an industrialized economy, uh, not, not, not the United States or Italy or Europe. But uh, there's industry, there's buildings, there's, there's transportation. The message I want to leave very, very clearly is that if we are to change this picture and go to a very low carbon economy, as I will emphasize, electricity is very important, but it will not get us there. We are going to have to work on the solutions, the technologies across all of these sectors. 
We need a low carbon industrial sector. We need a low carbon transportation sector as well as a low carbon electricity sector. I'll say it now, I'll, I'll, we'll work through this. The electricity sector is easy to decarbonize compared with the other sectors. We have many options. It won't be easy, but a lot easier than the other sectors. If we succeed in going to very low carbon electricity, then our next good move is to electrify as much as we can in transportation and in industry. In transportation, we can easily see, in principle, how to electrify for light-duty vehicles. It gets much harder when you consider other parts of the transportation sector, let's say especially airplanes, which aren't going to be running on batteries anytime soon. But what about industry? There are things that we can do. Higher efficiency, combined heat and power, which is essentially efficiency, more electric motors. But if you think about it, that doesn't get you where you want to go because a lot of industry depends upon very high temperature processes, steel making, petrochemicals. There's an enormous need to, well, an enormous use of carbon as a reducing agent, which ends up with CO2. So the message is we need to focus on all of these sectors, and I'm going to give a punchline right now, and then I'm going to go through this, and I don't think we can get where we need to go based upon this discussion only. We're going to have to add to it various approaches to large-scale carbon management. So I'll go through this, but I want to leave that's, that's the thread of the, of the argument that, that, we will, that we will see. So clearly the, the challenges here, as we're just addressing climate change, we do have a concern about we will need to adapt as well because we're not going to eliminate all the effects of global warming. We have to remember that we have to do this in the context of 9 to 10 billion people in this century on the planet. And they will be very heavily urbanized. Roughly speaking, we will add another 2.5 billion people to the planet and they will all be, I don't mean they individually, but that two and a half billion will all turn up in big cities. We've got to think about that as we address the solutions. And finally, I do want to add that in addition to uh, addressing climate change, addressing energy security internationally remains a big issue. I'm not going to focus on that. I will just say that the extent to which we can solve the low carbon problem we will also solve energy security problems. The sun and the wind are pretty much everywhere as opposed to oil, for example. This is a uh, projection only of sea level rise with a four degree centigrade warming. This is a picture of Shanghai with four, with, with four degrees. It's still not as beautiful as Venice. But, uh, but it's beginning to go in this direction. Uh, uh, now, you, first thing you've said is, well, four degrees, what are you talking about? The world agreed to two degrees. We're on a trajectory for four degrees if we don't work harder at it. So obviously, we'd like to avoid this, but it is kind of where we're going. Secondly, that won't happen in Shanghai because there will be adaptation. The Chinese in 50 years will easily be able to afford the water management to have this not be Shanghai, but it's expensive. 